Hey everybody. So this lesson is implied ideas. Now, honestly, this is one of the hardest things that students have problems with, okay? Because once you've trained so intensely on direct details, sometimes you can get a little bit confusing when you're looking for an answer choice that's not there. But I'm gonna show you today how, you know, it's really still, it's still just an extension of direct details. If you're thinking like, oh, I can imply any old idea, right? Oh, it's sure, the weather's nice, so they're gonna go outside for the day, right? That's a reasonable inference, but that would be a wrong answer in the SAT, okay? So I'm gonna show you what kind of answers we can look for that are still implied. Let's take a look. Now, this is that same passage from the last lesson. Again, we don't need to read it. We don't need to read it. Let's just focus on the question. Based on the passage, the author statement, if a pair consisted of two purines, for example, there would not be room for it, implies that a pair... So essentially, we're being asked, what does this line imply? What can we infer from this line? Now, here's the line within the context of the passage. But when I read it by itself, I have no idea what it's talking about. If a pair consisted of two purines, for example, there'd be no room for it. No room for the pair, like, I, don't ha I can't answer a question based on that. What's the inference here? Well, my first inference, to be honest, would be that two purines are too big for wherever it's supposed to go. Now, if one of those answer choices says that, I'm already done. Um, but I like to just go back to one sentence before, usually, just to make sure and save time so I don't have to go back and forth, back and forth, if I don't feel 100% confident about the answer. So let's go ahead and read that. One member of a pair must be a purine and the other a pyrimidine in order to bridge between the two chains. Okay, so it's kind of clear. It just said in order for it to do its job, to bridge the chains, one has to be a purine and the other a pyrimidine. And the sentence I care about, it just says, hey, but if there are two purines, it won't fit. So what's my inference? I think my inference is that a purine and a pyrimidine fit, but two purines don't fit. Okay, so let's see if which of these answer choices say that. A, of purines, sorry, let's, read, let's actually read the sentence. You can't actually read it just like that because it's a little confusing. You have to say a pair of purines would be larger than the space between a sugar and a phosphate group. Well, it kind of makes sense for a second there. It says the purines would be larger. Because I did say that the two pairs of purines wouldn't fit. So the purines are definitely larger, but it was larger than a purine and a pyrimidine pair, right? Not larger than a sugar and a phosphate group. So A doesn't seem like that's right. B says it implies that a pair of purines would be larger than a pair of consisting of a purine and a pyrimidine. Okay, so, I mean, that pretty much says exactly what I just said. So. I'm pretty confident that's the answer, only because it's such a direct match. Now, why is this an inference? Doesn't that say almost the same thing as what the passage did? Yeah, it does, right? But that's what the College Board considers an inference. That's the inference, because it never actually said that the purines would be larger than the purine and pyrimidine. It just said that if you had the pyrimidine, the, sorry, the pair of purines, they wouldn't fit. If you had the pair of purines and pyrimidines, these things are kind of hard to say, that it would fit. Hence, if one fits and the other doesn't fit, I mean, it's probably too big, right? So that is an implied idea. It's that level of support. Now, I just want to you know, give a little tangent here to say that a lot of the times that, you know, a lot of the reasons why we as students get this question wrong is in high school, when you're talking in your English class or your history class, the teacher will ask a question People raise their hands and throw out their ideas of what it could mean. And that's great. You're interpreting. You're thinking critically about it. And the teachers love it, right? Great answer, John. Great answer, Susan. But does that mean that it's a correct idea? It means that you had a good thought based on the passage, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It's something worth thinking about. Now, if we extend that now and said, would the college board encourage that? Is that something that the College Board would want to put in their tests? Actually, I don't know. Maybe they would. But a better question is, could they actually grade that? Because if, like, I know from your classroom discussions, you've probably seen, like, 
everyone in the class comes up with different answers, right? But how can I pick one of those as the correct answer? They could all be right. So that's why the College Board finds something as direct as this. Even though it's implied, it has to be so strongly supported that nobody could complain and say, oh, it could be this other answer or that other answer. And keep that in mind. You're looking for the incontrovertible evidence, the evidence that shows that it cannot be any possible answer, but it must be this one. OK. Let's continue. Um, here's another passage. It's a passage from that practice test as well, but don't worry about reading it again. We don't care. And this is a really great example, because if you want to, just press pause now and read it. And it's a bit of a tricky passage. It's a bit of a tr tricky passage to read, actually. But I'm going to show you right now that in answering this question, even though you haven't read it, even though the passage is a little bit tricky, you can still answer this question with great confidence. Here's the question. The range of places and occasions listed in line 72 to 76 mainly serves to emphasize how Okay, so what's being emphasized by these lines? Let's take a look. Here are the lines. Let us think in offices, in omnibuses, while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations and Lord Mayor's shows. Let us think in the gallery of the House of Commons, in the law courts. Let us think at baptisms and marriages and funerals. The first thing that strikes me is that this is just a list of things, right? It's a list. Let us think here, let us think there, let us think there. So whenever I, say, whenever I see a list, whenever I see an example, whenever I see a quotation, I go back to the sentence beforehand to see why it's there. Right? So let's read the sentence prior to this one. Think we must. <laughs> it doesn't say a lot, right? But it says, we must think. We must think. And then it tells us all the different places we must think. So if we look at the question, my first answer is going to be, you know, this list is emphasizing how we must think and how we must think everywhere. That's it. And a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, I don't understand that. That doesn't really make that much sense to me. Why are they saying that? I agree. But if I can find an answer that says that, I'm done. I don't have to kind of try to pass and break down the rest of the passage. Okay? So let's check the answers again. So it serves to emphasize how novel the challenge faced by women is how novel the challenge is, so how new and interesting. I, I don't remember, I was looking for how we must think everywhere, so that doesn't seem right. B, how pervasive the need for critical reflection is. Like, that's almost a perfect answer, isn't it? It's pervasive, it's everywhere. The need for thinking or criti cr critical reflection. So B is like a, a pretty perfect answer. I'm going to select that as my answer choice. But just to be sure, let's check C and D. Shows how complex the political and social issues of the day are. Irrelevant, didn't mention that. However, if you had read the passage, the passage was kind of about how uh, you know, women at this era and the kind of their rights and their right to do things. So a lot of you would pick C based on the passage. But when you get back to those details, the evidence, nothing about those two sentences mentioned political and social issues. It just said think everywhere. And that's why you cannot pick that as an answer choice. Okay? So I'm going to cross off political and social issues and say that's the reason why. That's the reason why it can't be the answer. Finally, D, how enjoyable the career possibilities for women are. Again, that's a throwaway answer, isn't it? Like, enjoyable? What? Where? Career possibilities? That's not anywhere either, right? So it can't be D either. So not D. So B is a confirmed answer. Let's finalize this. Let's see what we need to review. Remember, you must pick an answer that describes the lines that are referred to. Don't go looking elsewhere in the passage for inference. Find it within that line or the line before or after sometimes. Very importantly, do not infer possible answers. Right? Just because it's possible that it's referring to political and social issues, if it doesn't say it, if it's not pretty direct, it cannot be the answer. So if that seemed not too bad to you, OK? And let me be clear here. Just because you understand it now, you're not necessarily going to be able to go and do it by yourself right away. It's like math, right? 
I remember when I was in school, the math teacher would put a problem on the board, explain it. I'd be like, oh, I got it. Easy. I don't need to do any homework. I remember how to do that. And I'd go home, and later I'd try to do the problem, perhaps. And I'd forget, how, how was I supposed to do that again? So unless you reinforce it, unless you practice, you're not going to be able to do it for yourself on command. Okay, so it's really important to do that, even if this idea seems simple.